All right, Revelation chapter 5 will we'll summarize and kind of remind us, our, you know, get back on track regarding what, what we're talking about here in chapter 4 and chapter 5. But in chapter 5, John is going to see a sealed book. The New American Standard uses the word book. In the original, it's scroll, and that's what would have been referenced there. But it, the scroll is in the open right hand of the one sitting on the throne, and John becomes troubled because there's seemingly no one who can break the seals on this book. But then John uh, is shown a vision of, of Jesus, uh, of Christ, of the Lamb. It's the risen Christ, the overcomer, who takes the book as the four creatures and 24 elders fall down in worship of the Lamb. John then sees that myriads of angels have joined in praise and worship along with every other created thing. So... Uh, that's chapter 5 in a nutshell. That's what's going on. And uh, if you're reading Wes's little book on this, uh, he kind of begins his analysis of the chapter by noting that this chapter concerns itself with exalting Jesus above all other beings, uh, all other uh, beings who are worshipped, you know, in the Roman Empire. You, you have all these little G gods that various people worship, and Jesus is being exalted above all of them. And then remember what we said last week, these chapters are about providing perspective. So fixing a picture within Christians of the reality of what's going on in heaven and ultimately who is in control. And so that was what, that, that's what's happening in figuring out the throne and everything around the throne in chapter 4 and then in chapter 5 as we're given this picture of the Lamb. And so McGuigan's take is the saints are, are urged to rest assured that whatever they see hereafter, all is well for the world and all uh, Jesus, let's see, for the world is under the control of the creator, God the Father, and the all-powerful, all-wise lamb. He continues, uncontrolled fear or panic is out of place in light of such power. And, and there, there are just some places, well, most of the time, uncontrolled fear or panic is not a good thing, Right? Um, and when I think of uncontrolled fear, panic, for some reason, my mind always goes to an Andy Griffith episode where Barney Fife is just in a panic, and he's running around the room, and he doesn't know what to do, and that's never where we need to be as God's people. So let's dive in. Verse 1, uh, I saw in the right hand, and of course, it's a right-handed world, and those of us who are left-handed hate that, but it's a right-handed world, and, and the right hand is the hand of what? Power. It's, it signifies power. So, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book, and of course, actually, it's a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. So, um, it's the idea of it's sitting on the hand. It's not necessarily hand clasped around it, but, but an open hand. It's sitting on the hand. Uh, why would the scroll be written on both sides? Is, is that normal and is that significant? Not normal. not normal. Okay, Doug says not normal, and I would agree. Why not normal? Uh, really signifies something, uh, a large text uh, that they wrote on both sides because one side of the tire is hard to write on because of the ground. Okay. Any, anything else it might signify? And, and, of course, we're speculating a bit. But we're talking about a vision that's sealed up, that's about to be unsealed. And so uh, one of the, the writers said it could be, I think this was Roper, um, could symbolize the completeness of the message, the finality of the revelation. In other words, after you know, there's not going to be anything else. The, the message from God is complete, and that would... That would that would be supported by Revelation 22, 18 and 19 toward the end of the book. How does the book end? What does it say? Now, a lot of times these verses are kind of pulled a little bit out of context. And, and in one sense, it's appropriate because I think it applies to anything God said. But 18 and 19 of 22, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. And so 
part of the thought is, perhaps written on both sides, means the revelation, it, this is it. It's full, it's complete. Maybe, maybe not. Um, what is this going to contain? Or, or this, this scroll, it, it seemingly is going to contain the rest of the message of revelation. And as the seals are broken, uh, various scenes unfold, and we'll see that in chapter 6. Um, now, Romans, the Romans were big on seals. Why did you seal a document? Showed ownership, uh, protected in what way? Right, if, I, if you uh, don't necessarily want everyone to know what you've written and, and want everybody to see it as it goes, you seal that, and then only the one with authority um, you know, to whom that was sent could unseal. Uh, I think back to years ago, we would get trucks in that have to be unloaded. Well, the truck would come in with a seal on it, and that was to protect the driver because it was sealed when he left the... Pre you know, you might have multiple stores being delivered on one truck, and so when he left the store before us, it's sealed with a number, and so we had to sign off when he got there that it was the same seal that he left the previous store with, and then when he was leaving our store, we had to sign off on the seal that was being put on the truck. That was all about making sure the driver was protected because if he shows up with an empty truck, who are they going to look at first? The driver, because he's the one that had, has had access to the stuff the whole time, and so if the truck is still sealed, that means nothing's happened to it. So seals, we understand kind of what that's about. So if a document was sealed, only one with authority could unseal it. And Israel understood this as well. Uh, both Ezekiel and Daniel uh, speak of scrolls with seals to be opened by only, you know, only by those who had authority. So seals are, are, are not a big thing or a new thing to, um, to the Jews or to the Christians either. They would understand this. Verse 2. And we'll do two through four. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? We've got a sealed book. We need someone with authority. The angel's asking the question. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look in it. And so, what would John have to believe is in the book? Because if, a, if, if I come across a sealed letter or a sealed book that I don't have any interest in, do, do, I, have, do I care whether it gets unsealed? If it's a book I don't care about? Well, no. So John, evidently, he's very interested in what this is going to be. West take is evidently John weeps because the scrolls contain the redemptive plans of God for mankind, and if no one opened the scrolls, then these plans would remain unknown. And the word weeping here, because um, there's are there multiple ways to cry? You know, there's a little light crying, and then there's heavy duty weeping, and the the word used here is weeping caused by anguish deeper than physical pain. So, I mean, he is deeply, deeply troubled by this. So, Kester says the, the sealed scroll creates a sense of expectancy as assumption, an assumption that it must contain some sort of divine decree. Obviously, it's in the hand of God on the throne. It's going to eventually be taken and unsealed by, by Jesus. So, obviously, it's a divine decree. And since a seal ensured that the intentions of the author contained in a text were unaltered by someone else, Kester notes that presumably the seals were to protect the contents of God's scroll, but they also indicate that God has willed things that may not have been fully carried out. So God has some plans that may not be complete yet at the time of this. If you're a persecuted Christian, is that good news to you? Well, it could be. I mean, if I'm, in a, if I'm going through a lot of trouble, the idea that God hasn't finished working the plan, I would see that as good news. Maybe there is going to be relief at some point. And, and I think we're going to see that. Uh, I, I guess it depends on, on how you look at it. Um, so, five and six. Go ahead. John is actually on the path. Yes. Yes. 
Right. Uh, it may see this as a chance for you to open the fixtures that are going to suffer, 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 suffer. Pot yeah, potentially so. It's a good, good point. Because when you're going through it, it's really hard to think about there being, you know, it's hard to see the end of the, the better day that maybe is going to be, be ahead. So, interesting thing happens in 5 and 6. One of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So who is this elder just described? Well, when you start reading lion, tribe of Judah, root of David, the one who's overcome, who, who comes to mind? Jesus is who comes to mind. Oh, no, no, we don't, I'm sorry. No, we, the elder's not identified. Um, none of the, the 24 elders were not identified. That is. And, and so that means the elder evidently knows something that, that John doesn't yet know. Uh, and so that's why he's telling John. And so John hears a description of Jesus. He hears the lion that's from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the one who's overcome. But is that what John's going to see in the vision? No. And, and so there's kind of a, a dissonance there. He's going he's gonna to hear one thing, but he's going to see something completely different, even though it's still Jesus. Uh, verse 6, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So... There, you know, he, he sees this, but then this, this lamb. You know, do, do we, when we think of a lamb, do we think of great strength? No. We, we don't think brilliance. We, there, there are a lot of things that don't come to mind when we think of a lamb, but the thing of it is, uh, and one of, the guys, one of the commentators points out, from this point forward, the dominant uh, image for Jesus in Revelation not the only, but the dominant one will be from this point forward. He'll be uh, described as a lamb. And so he doesn't see a lion, sees the lamb. And so, you know, Kester states clearly the portrayal of the slaughtered lamb as a conqueror challenges ordinary modes of thinking. And that it, it's, it's thinking of one thing, but then seeing an image that's completely different. And again... Remember these chapters, they're providing a perspective on reality, on what's actually real. And so as an overcomer, Jesus is overcome in every way conceivable. But most importantly, he's overcome death. Now, lamb terminology, why does that resonate with us? What, 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 if you're going to go to one chapter in the Bible, where do you go? Isaiah 53. Prophecy from Isaiah about Jesus... And, and he is, you know, he is portrayed as that sacrificial lamb in Isaiah 53. And so that's what he'll be, noted, he'll, he'll be mentioned in terms of dominantly from this, this point forward. And so in this single vivid image of the lamb, John brings together multiple dimensions of meaning, vulnerability, sacrificial death, and deliverance. And, and so even though pictured as a lamb... What Jesus did is an act of power, and of course we understand that. And so Roper wants us to imagine a lamb on kind of wobbly legs with an open wound to the throat, blood staining down its fleece, yet this lamb is very much alive and it is after all standing. And um, Anybody watch any hunting videos ever? Hunting videos. Okay, and so sometimes the deer gets shot and it's bleeding out, but it doesn't know it's dead yet, and so it's standing on wobbly, you know, um, some of y'all hadn't seen it. 
those video, it's if you hunt, even not everybody hunts. But, but you got to understand what you're, the, the image here is, you know, we don't like gory stuff. Some people don't. But you've got a gory image here. You've got a lamb that had been slain but is, but is now very much alive. And so this lamb in the image still bears the wounds of having been at one point killed. So seven horns and seven eyes, lamb isn't helpless. Horns are a symbol of what? Power, strength. Seven eyes, a symbol of what? Knowing all, seeing all. You think of Second Chronicles sixteen nine, the eyes of the Lord move back and forth through the earth, so that he, you know that he may identify those whose hearts belong to him, or may strongly support. I think it says those whose hearts belong to him. And so this lamb, though it's been slain and now it's alive, is not uh, helpless. A- anything else about the slain lamb? I- Yeah, only the lamb is worthy to open the seals. He's the only one because he's overcome death. Very good. Excellent. Anything else on the land before we move forward? Didn't mean to get everybody um, with the hunting video, so (laughs) sorry. Uh, Seven and eight. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So the lamb taking the book from God on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So this is going to set the scene for the opening of the first seal, which is going to occur in chapter 6. And so in chapter 4, who received worship? God on the throne. Everything centers around and, and the worship is directed to God. But now what happens when the Lamb takes the scroll from God's hand? What begins to happen? Yeah, the, Jesus begins to receive worship. Um, there, and, and again, you know, if you think back to some of what we were talking about this morning, you see there uh, in 7 and 8 uh, the reference to each one holding a harp. And, and because some of the folks who want the instrument will say, well, hey, there, 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 there are harps in Revelation. There are harps in heaven. So why not now? Well, well, yeah, and again, whatever's going on here does not affect our instructions about what we do here and now. But, but it, again, I'm pointing it out because it's, one of the places people will go when they want to justify something that they want to do. Um, Are they holding literal golden bowls of incense? Because it says the golden bowls of incense are actually the prayers of the saints, and if they're not holding a literal bowl of incense, then they're probably not holding a literal harp either, but that's neither here nor there. So um, the bowls of incense signified prayer to God, and they're now being placed before the Lamb. It's kind of a callback to Psalm 141, verse 2. The psalmist said, May my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands at the evening offering. And, you know, our our prayers go up as an offering before God, uh, a sweet-smelling aroma at times. So 9 and 10. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon earth. 
And so you want a really good, concise summary of the work that Jesus did, you've got it right there in verses 9 and 10. That's the work of Jesus summed up in two verses. Uh, you were slain, but you purchased uh, for God with your blood men from, and man, that's mankind, people, men, women, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, not just the Jews, okay? Because that's, remember, with the letters to the churches, the problems of the Jews, that's one of the big problems the Christians faced, not just the Jews, but, oh, guess who else that could include? Romans that actually wanted to follow God. So it's, it's people, all people have been given that opportunity if they'll humble themselves before God. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they'll reign upon earth. Remember we said there's a lot of Old Testament tabernacle type imagery uh, when, we, when we get into this heavenly realm. And, and so you see that coming out again. Now, uh, there is a controversial statement at the end of verse 10 because of the way it's rendered in, in most of the translations. Verse 10 says, You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Now, what does that mean? Who is the they? Are we part of the they? We are part of the they. And do so the question is, do we reign upon the earth or will we reign upon the earth? How do you take that? And, and I'm really just kind of throwing it out there. If you've studied it, you may have some answers. If not, we're going to talk a little bit about it. You know, uh, where it talks about Jesus being slain. Right. In this, in this vision, that's something that had happened in the past. Now, in the vision, as that takes place, it talks about living. I believe that John is seeing that they, Christians will live upon the earth, and that's something that's going to take place and continue. Okay. This is one we need to talk about and understand because this is one of the places that the premillennialists will try to do some things with the text about this millennial reign. Jesus is going to come back and reign on the earth for a thousand years and stuff that it's not scripture. But these are the kind of little statements that they'll latch on to to support some of that false teaching. So we need to Right. Yeah, here's some of the, some of what's said, and then I'm going to read a statement from Roper. Uh, West, this meant they lived in such a manner that their lives were reigning and were supreme among the sons of men. Should our lives be something people can look to? They'd better be. Because we are God's expansion plan today. So our lives had better be something that people can look to and, and get an understanding that, that, that God is calling us to a higher way of living. Uh, McGuigan said, when the conflict is over, the church will be the only kingdom standing. Well, that's, not, that's, that's true. Uh, but I did want to read uh, part of Roper on this. I thought he did a good job in what he said. He said, in John's day, as Christians were thrown into prison and fed to the lions, it certainly did not appear that they were reigning. Today, as we flounder in the midst of problems, it may not look as if we are reigning. Appearances can be deceiving, however. In the turmoil of the first century, it surely appeared that God was no longer on his throne. But chapter 4 assured Christians that he was. And so he's, he's driving home this question, okay, well, what does it mean, Christians reigning on the earth? Well, here he's, he's going to say in several ways we reign now. We are the kingdom of Christ, Revelation 1 verse 6, which is the church. Since our God is, or since God is our father, we're part of the royal family. Since Christ is presently reigning and we are in Christ, we share in his reign. Since we have been saved, no longer does death reign over us. Rather, we've been given the strength to reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So he's explaining some of the ways that we as Christians reign right now. 
The other thing um, that, that comes into play here, he talks about the premillennialist writers, the use of the future tense in they will reign, they want to say is proof of a future reign of Christ on the earth, at which time, according to their doctrine, Christians will reign with them. Uh, there's a big question among scholars, though, whether present tense or future tense is actually the correct rendering of, of the, the English text there. Uh, some of the scholars don't believe that it should have been rendered future tense, but rather present tense. And so uh, that kind of comes into the discussion as well. But it doesn't change the fact, as Roper has pointed out, that we reign now uh, in, that, in the senses that he mentioned. Let's see, make sure I didn't skip anything. Uh, I think you mentioned Christians are already kings and priests, according to Scripture. Um, and then McGuigan points out, he says, Revelation 20, verse 6, uses future tense regarding Christians being priests, and then asks, does that mean we're not already priests? So um, it's going to happen again later in the letter. And so he also mentions that Revelation 1, 5, and 6 teaches that faithful Christians are presently reigning, and of course... Uh, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father to him. You know, so he's, he calls us priests now there in chapter 1. And so that's what McGuigan is alluding to. And so then that gets us to the, the last four verses of the chapter, verses 11 through 14. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing, and every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and on the sea, and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. And so chapter 5 is a scene of victory. It's a scene of worship. It's a scene of seeing Jesus respected and worshipped in the way that he should be. Um, in verse 13, regarding every created thing joining in praise, Kester states, this is God's will for the world. He continues, the vision invites those in the seven churches to join in the cosmic song of praise, but despite the joyous quality of the scene, readers in the seven churches will be shown that adding one's voice to the chorus can be a costly venture. Might there be a price to pay for worshiping the Lamb? There could be. And for some of these Christians, the original audience, some of these in the seven churches, there will be, and we'll see that talked about in the next chapter. And so McGuigan says, the whole creation reflects the worth and the power of Jesus. And so it's, it's poetic language with everything, everywhere, lifting up its voice in praise to the Lamb. And so as we read this, and, and Kester makes the point, he says, how would members of the seven churches react to this scene in the heavenly throne room? And he says, the reaction, depending on what's going on in your church, it could vary. How might Christians undergoing persecution react to a message like this? Questions? Right. Mm hmm. Yes, it's, it, and, and we've said that this, last week and this week, and, and I probably emphasized it more last week, the, these two chapters are about perspective, about what's real. Is persecution real? Yes. But is persecution real in the sense that it's final, that it has, that it's what's going to win? 
can persecution win? Maybe that's the way you ask it. No, and I think when you talk about verse 6, you're, you're getting this perspective of a lamb with all of this power. And so if you are persecuted, that should give you hope and confidence, um, the hope for a better tomorrow. And we'll see that play out even more as these seals are broken. Um, the second question that's thrown out, if you are in one of these churches and you're seeking to be accommodating to the Greco-Roman religious culture of the day, I want to fit in, I want to blend in, if I just kind of make myself a part of that and don't, don't put up too much of a fuss, then maybe they leave me alone. If that goes on, how might these visions affect you? Would they make you uneasy in any way? And if so, why? The only reason you'd want to fit into culture is because you believe Rome's power is something you've got to be afraid of, right? I, I'm so fearful of Rome's power and what might happen to me. I want to avoid the persecution that I know some of these other folks are going through. So I'm going to do everything I can to fit in. I'm going to keep my head down. If I got to go to some of these feasts to, to make sure I can still make a living and hang out with some of these people and act like I'm okay with their worship, I'm going to do that. It might unsettle me a little bit to realize I'm aligning myself with a power that's going to lose. I still like Randy Harris's breakdown of Revelation. God's team wins. Pick a team. His word, not mine, because I know we got kids in here. Don't be stupid. I mean, and if you boil it down, that, that's really the, the heart of Revelation, is it not? And so if I've aligned myself with all these powers and I'm trying to keep my head down and fit in so I avoid persecution, what team have I picked? I've picked the losing team. And so that could be unsettling. And then the third group, you've got, that, you've got those folks, but then what, what was the third group that we've read about in these seven churches? The, the church, say, at Laodicea, what's their, what's their story? complacent, self-satisfied, would they find this vision disturbing? They ought to. Why? Right. Uh, in comparison to the splendor of God's presence, their pride in their wealth and prestige is shown to be an act of self-deception. And it kind of brings to mind uh, James 4, verse 4. Uh, James writes, you adulteresses. And why would God ever call his people adulteresses? Because they're doing what? An adulteress has done what? Y'all are asleep. An adulteress has cheated on her spouse, right? That's what an adulteress has done. And so if James would call Christians adulteresses, what have the Christians done? They've cheated on God. I mean, this is, we know what the word means. It's okay to say it. And so you adulteresses, do you not know, and this would actually apply to the other group we were talking about, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. God's team wins. Pick a team. Don't be, you know, not smart. So, who am I going to align myself with? Because I've just been shown reality. The reality is God's on his throne. The Lamb has all power. Um, and so not to be lost on us, that scene in heaven, it really should still have our attention today. Because the reality of chapter 4 and chapter 5, has any of that changed? That's still the reality today. And so it's shown us what's real um, we're not undergoing persecution, but we have the, uh, that fitting in temptation and we have that complacent temptation sometimes because we have very good lives for the most part. Um, and so what we've been shown is that is still the seed of true power. Uh, those who enter that scene, which we want to be a part of that one day, we will fall down in worship there, unending worship there. 
Um, and if we are accommodating the world or being complacent, these visions, you know, should in some ways unsettle us. Um, they, should, they should jolt us back into making sure that James 4 verse 4 would never apply to us, if you want to think about it that way. So um, it, we're, we're going to get done a couple of minutes early tonight, and maybe that's a good thing because, you know, having the kids in and not having them have their class uh, anything, any other questions about chapter 5? Any other points you all want to bring up about chapter 5 tonight? 